out this morning. Welcome to everybody. That was just a nugget. You can go to Hebrews. And I want to, I want to uh, really help us. And uh, because I, I, what I've learned is this, it's not how much you know, but rather it's, it's what I'm applying. How many understand that? It's so important to not think of knowledge in the sense of just knowledge, but rather knowledge and how I can practice that knowledge incrementally, moment by moment, day by day. And then build and, and cultivate a lifestyle of it. And that's not necessarily easy. Right? It's not necessarily easy, but it can be accomplished. And, and I want to tell you this. It's not easy because you have some adversaries. Don't you? You got an adversary, number one, the devil. The D-E-V-I-L which, you know, just the fact that that lady on Charisma Magazine and that, that thread was arguing against the work of the devil, man. She don't know the word. I don't know how you could call yourself a Christian and not be in the Bible. I, I just don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. That's like saying I'm a golfer, but I ain't got a set of clubs. <laughs> I'm a baseball player, but I don't own a mitt. I mean, right? I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, I'm a doctor, but I don't have, you know, the stethoscope or, or any of the it don't make sense i don't have the license uh, but come on now are you with me this is a lot of people's mindsets in life they're just they, they don't have the things that go along uh, with the core things that accompany that's a great word amen so you and i want to be fit and that takes time in the word and it takes renewing your mind. I know these truths. And that's why I'm saying I know these truths. I read them every day. That's why I read them every day. Because the moment I think, oh, I know that. I've done that for 28 years or 30 years. I'm a Christian. Boy, dangerous, man. I'm telling you, it's dangerous. I've got to pray every day. Not out of works, but out of dependence. Does, does that sound right? Out of dependence, because because I don't trust myself. Not that I feel bad about myself, but I don't trust my thinking. Because uh, no matter how long I've been in the Word, you know, I may have some uh, understanding on stuff, but you know, life is progressive. You know, and to meet every condition in life, I've got to have a fresh word from God, not stale manna. And if I'm gonna have a fresh word, I got to be in His presence, right? I got to keep, you know, uh, forging forward, keep putting myself in a position like, uh, um, you know, to hear him. He'll, he'll tell you the, the truth. He'll give you the guidance that is needed. Here's a good example, and then we'll get into this, is uh, a little testimony on, on things. Is You know, where, you ever heard that saying, where God guides, God provides? There's truth to that. That's not a Bible passage, okay? But there's a truth to that. Where, where he leads, I could give you Isaiah. It says, thus saith the Lord that teaches you to profit and leads you in the way you should go. It's like Isaiah 48, 17 or 46, 17. Um, that word profit is to make progress, to improve, and, and to go forward. That's what it means. To profit, to benefit, right? And so... Uh, listen to the Holy Spirit, but that takes time. It's not like I can just say, Holy Spirit, tell me right now, because I have a natural mind. And my natural mind has a lot of natural information. It has different experiences and different things. So I've got to get in the spirit. Now, how long does it take me to get in the spirit? I don't know. Some days it takes five minutes. I could turn on a worship song. I could pray in tongues and boom, I slip right in. You know, when you're in the spirit, because you ever wake up and you're groggy and you're like, mm, and then you start praying quarter, blah, blah. And next thing you got some nice little worship music on. And then all of a sudden you get that smile. You're like, thank you, Father. You moved into the spirit, but you didn't wake up in the spirit. You moved into the spirit. Moving into the spirit, you became more conscious of spiritual things and God's presence and love than you did of your natural cir circumstances. That's why, you know, I don't like when I'm praying, I don't like people making noise because by the time you're really tuned in, like on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday nights, by the time you're tuned in, listening to the Lord, you're like, somebody can be over there, be like making all kinds of noise and their phones ringing. And what's that doing? It's a distraction. It's pulling you out into the flesh. 
That's why the Lord said, be still and know that I'm God. So I always came back from my trip and then, uh, you know, I had, you know, my leg, it's still, it was a lot more swollen and yeah, it just went like that. And then the nerves, the bones heal, but the nerves, are, you know, I have to continue to speak to them and believe God for restoration. When I came back, uh, I had got, God had supernaturally worked out where I had got some state disability on that. You know, I had an I had invested in that from working and uh, man, it was amazing. I couldn't get anything on the line. One day I picked up the phone. Lord said, pick up the phone, call his number, call some lady from Sacramento answer. You never get just right direct, right to him direct. I mean, try to get on. It just went right direct. And I was like, hello, ma'am. Here's my problem. You know, she goes, Oh, send me this, send me, that. sent me that. They accepted it. I was able to get some resources. Well, on January 4th, you know, I was like, Hey, I'm not going to keep going back to the doctor for whatever reason. And, and this doctor's, my doctor was out and uh, some other doctor came. He's like, Oh, I'm sending you back to work. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, sir, you see the size of that? He's like, that's just swelling and da, 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 da. And I'm like, so I'm talking and you know, I'm like, he ain't going to hear. So he gives me the paper. I send it in. But after January 4th, he's like, yeah, I can't help you anymore. And I'm like, okay, whatever, man. I just left. Well, I was praying one day, you know, I, wa I wasn't like broke or anything, but I was praying one day and the Lord said, send that paper back in and call that, call, call your doctor up. And I, I, was, I was like, all right. Went over to the doctor. The doctor said, nope, I can't help you. The original doctor came back. Then he said, nope, nope, nope. And I'm like, well, you know, and he goes, go see your general practitioner. I've already seen you enough, which is just policy. He's like our policy. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. So I'm not arguing, but I'm, I'm hearing what the Lord said. Then I went and seen the general practitioner. He goes, look, this is what I can do for you. I can see our chart says you're supposed to be 100% perfect, but, but obviously people's muscles and tissues, you know, heal at different paces. So he goes, I can see, he goes, I'll give you three weeks extension. So that's fine. I go, okay, no problem. I just, I just want, you know, I wasn't looking for that. I'm just, you know, I'm following the Lord and, uh, making sure that they didn't miss something too. You know what I mean? Some, cause it's happened to people. They've missed something. There was a chip bone spur in there. All of a sudden they went back, re-x-rayed it. And they're like, here's the problem, you know? So you, you've got to do your double checking. And so, uh, but there was a gap for like 21 days. So that Kaiser calls me up and they go, Oh yeah, we're going to, we can't upload the three day, three week extension. Cause there's a gap between those dates. So I called that other first doctor back. He said, nope, can't do it. Nope, his, his secretary's online. And then I just thought, okay. I'm like, I got off the phone. I wasn't discouraged or nothing because I don't even care. The Lord told me to do it. So I was like, Lord, you told me to send a paperwork in. I didn't doubt once. I called up the general practitioner. He goes, oh, he already had told me he can't do it because he didn't see me. I called him. He just goes, uh, you know, David, I saw there was a gap there and I saw the report from that. He goes, I just uploaded it. You're all taken care of. I was like, he's, I was like, thanks, sir. Appreciate it. And then they sent me a check. Someone said, you know, I know, I know, I hear you. I hear you. Where you follow the Lord. I wasn't asking for that. The Lord sent it. And I didn't even know it. I had some union dues due. I had some other bills due. You know, I needed some money to give to the church. Come on. Just trying to tell you. The Lord knows where he guides, he provides. But if you ain't spending time with it, matter of fact, I can tell you this, and I'm going to get on it. It was like two weeks ago. I told you. I've said it right here in church. The Lord kept telling me, hey, I want you to start learning about the stock market. I mean, but, you know, if you're slow, you might have been one of those people that invested in game stock. I saw some guy this morning and I was like, man, Lord, he, he, he was in England and he's like, I've always wanted to do the stock market. I don't know nothing about it. One day I just thought, I don't have thousands. He goes, I had like, I think he said he had like 500 bucks or something. He's like, I just did it. I just went in my bank and they had a thing and I went and he goes, he invested in, he saw a couple reports about these people and he just shot it in there to GameStop and, and the guy's up like 46 G's. And, and he had, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, oh, my point is, is, you know, and I thought, you know, 
if you and I will listen to the Spirit of God, he, he can tell you what to do in life. And a, a big problem with a lot of people is money. They're like money-minded. I'm not money-minded person, personally. I, I think more about God than I do money and myself. Money is a necessity. How many of you understand that? You need money. You got to pay bills and stuff. But there ain't no need to fret about it if you li live like Jesus. Jesus said, take no thought. Take no thought. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? What about my future? What about this? What about that? How am I going to do this? Take no thought. He doesn't want us consumed with that. He wants us to be consumed with him. That doesn't mean don't use common sense. It just means take no thought. Do not be immersed with the fears of the world, the anxiety of the ages, all the challenges that are going on. Amen? Don't be concerned. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think in your life. But you have to believe him for that, right? It's fine that I believe that, but you have to establish that conviction for yourself. And that means you'll have to be in his presence and in his word. So Hebrews, go on over to Hebrews chapter 5. I read this to my son yesterday. He was explaining to him. Uh, I'll get there in just a second. Uh, you know, my son had broke his foot as well, doing something like, you know, just young boys do, riding around on motorcycles and having fun. But he's an athlete. And there's a thing coming up here, uh, a thing coming up here this week. And uh, I told him, look, man, you can't be like other people, other young fellas, other young fellas that aren't athletes. They don't have to be very careful of their bones and their muscles and what they eat and what they do and the investment of their time because they're, they're probably not going to be looked at for a Division I school. You understand? But, but if you have a gift, and you'll know if you have a, a, a real gift, you know. Uh, there was – I saw a guy yesterday. He's like, hey, it's uh, – and this guy, uh, he went to Cal Berkeley, and I think he, he's like a Filipino guy and real nice and he, he had got a hip thing, and I asked, well, how's your son doing? He, well, he came down from Seattle, and he's going to UOP playing ball. And I was like, uh, how come he didn't go to Berkeley, man? And uh, like, he can make it. He's like, oh, because he wanted the free scholarship, <laughs> which is wise, you know. But there's a kid I know who I coach. He's at Berkeley right now. Last year as a freshman, he was just excelling. And so he's, he's a real ball player, and he has the grades, and he's conditioning, Right. He's training. So you and I need to understand, right, where you are at as a Christian. And I talked to my other friend, my Simone friend yesterday. He's, he's like an associate pastor, pastor Simone. And he's like, wow, man, I'm just, I've cut off all this stuff. And man, I'm really, the, and you know, and he's a little more, a little more geared this way. But, you know, I, I didn't necessarily like, he's like, I plan this and plan it. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. So, you know, I'm not really one to try to plan everything. I want to hear what God has planned. You know what I mean? Work with, with those plans that God gives you. You can't say, well, I'm going to do this for my life here. And then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this if God didn't endorse it. Because the scripture says, you know, your life's but a vapor. Don't say, I'll go to this city and buy and trade and sell and do what I want. Say, if the Lord will. Say, if the Lord will. Right. Then I'll follow that. So. Um, talking about the importance of training, believers need to know in this hour, you really do. It's what the scriptures teach. Uh, a lot of people are, oh, well, we can make through this together. And the world has all kinds of stuff that people believe in. They're still on the same hamster wheel. They're still, my, see, my job is not to say, look at the world. I don't care about the world. Just like I said in this video the other day I made, I don't, personally, I, I don't care what Dr. Fauci says. Do you know that? I don't care. I mean, I can respect a man and try to listen to him, but ultimately, I've already settled before Dr. Fauci ever came on who my healer was and who my physician was. It's already been settled a long time ago. You understand? So Dr. Fauci, Dr. This, you know, Mr. This and Mr. That. I got too much experience with personal in my life, seeing God as a healer and a preserver and a keeper to put my, to change my source of counsel. 
Now, that doesn't mean I just told you I'll go to the doctor because I'm not a doctor. But, but I know this, that Jesus is a healer. And so I've got to maintain. And many people don't get healed, number one. I'll tell you this, because of what's going on within them. See, Jesus can be your healer. But if you don't know how to receive from your doctor, therein lies a problem. Could be doubt and unbelief, could be other issues that are going on in the heart that is hindering and stifling your ability to receive. That's the truth. That's why time in the presence of God is important. For instance, if you have a root of bitterness against somebody, it's going to be very hard to receive healing. It's very hard. That's what scripture teaches. Mark eleven twenty four, 24, uh, 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 Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Looking diligently for a root of bitterness, lest it spring up and trouble you, and thereby many fall short of the grace of God and are defiled. Now, lots of Christians, they don't even want to understand the word defilement. They think, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not defiled. Look, look, man. It's easy to get soiled in this world. And the more, so it's like this. You work with your hands with tools. You know what happens right here? Callous. The Bible teaches you. You can, your, your, your conscience can be what? Seared like a hot iron. You ever irons your shirt? And you're like, oh, I got to run in the room. And you left your iron on, the, on your jeans or your shirt. And then you came back and that thing was like steam coming up. And you're like, man, that was my good pair of jeans or my blouse. It got, and, and you see the little shiny part if it's like a blouse or a shirt. And you're like, you're trying to get the water on there to try to get it back into, you know, so it doesn't look. It, it's been seared. It's been seared. And, and thank God, you know, and then we can move on here. You could have a seared conscience. That just means you're dull. But the good thing about it, if you'll get in the spirit, the Holy Ghost and the word, which sharper than any two-edged sword, just begins to cut away. Cut away the dullness. Cut away the callousness. And resensitize your spirit. So that you hear his sweet voice. Do you understand that? It's very important in this hour. Now I know a lot of people go, well, you know, I'm already hearing the Lord in this. Just the fact that you have to defend that. Mm -mm. Amen. The Lord is working. Right. And all of us can become dull. I became dull and insensitive at, at different points in my walk. And I'm like, man, once you become dull and insensitive, you start believing things that aren't true. Right. You start. And what I mean is this. You start going, yeah, but, you know, what if, you know, I'm just human, you know, uh, I'm black, I'm white, I'm Asian, I'm Filipino. I didn't have a right education. Um, do you know that no, there's nowhere in the Bible with any of that? And Jesus actually endorsed many people that were, uh, you know, in, in, in a social status way below the leper. The centurion, hmm? the Syrophoenician woman. Because you know Jesus didn't go, you know what? I can see your color, your race, your education, your bank account. Jesus don't care about none of that, really. That's the truth. Real believers, Jesus does not care about any of that. He, he don't care. He just says, do you have faith or not? That's, that's all Jesus cared about. When the woman came to him, Syrophoenician, he said, I, want, I need a healing. And he said, can't give that, which is the breadcrumb. You can't give that to the dogs. Because there was cultural clashing going on between the Jews and Samaritans. Do your history. There was actually right there, there was racism, if you want to know. And she came to Jesus and Jesus said, by covenant right, I can't give you what isn't belonging to you and and actually samaritans had some jewish roots actually but they they also had some other stuff and i don't do a lot of study on the history but i did enough to tell you that and she came and she said absolutely true i don't deserve the loaf of bread because i'm not an israelite and a covenant child but dogs eat crumbs that fall off the table i mean and jesus said Phew, that 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 
I mean, Jesus was taken back and said, that's some faith, man. I mean, most people today would get offended. They'd get, you know, start attacking. They would get, you know, call up the local news agency. They would go into all their reasonings why Jesus wasn't a good Christian and how he was, you know, that woman said, no, nah, I just need a crummer. I mean, that's the truth. I want to get a crumb. And I'll tell you this, that God brings respect. Meekness and humility will take you a long way. Amen. Take you a long way with Jesus. I mean, and, and Jesus isn't a respecter of persons. When those apostles and disciples who were, you know, Jews were on the back of the boat, he just walked up and rebuked them all and said, you will unbelief. You ain't got none but a bunch. Where is your faith? I mean, so you had all kinds of people on different levels. The leper came down and he didn't know. So Jesus gave him a break. He said, man, I know you got power, Jesus, but I don't know if you want to do it for me. So you get a pass on that one. And Jesus said, I will be thou clean. You know, so you can you see the most important thing is to understand if he has the power or not. That's where a lot of people are in error today. They don't really believe in that power. Right. That person, that leper did. I know you can cleanse, heal, deliver, set free, liberate, emancipate. I know you got the power for it. I just don't know if I'm worthy enough to receive it. And Jesus changed that right there and said, look, I make you worthy. Be clean. And then he went and preached. Amen. So you can see, I don't want to get on. Now let's go to Hebrews 5 because I'll start speaking. I am just want to get you in. I'll, I'll, I can share a lot. I'll tell you this. Dude, you'll get healed listening to this message. You'll get healed listening to this message. And I don't even have to go into healing scriptures. I remember this. I was at this last meeting. Uh, Brother Hagin, he taught all on love. And I said, that's the greatest sermon I ever heard. I'm not kidding. And I didn't know he was going to, he was going to, uh, he was going to die like a month later. I was like, that's the greatest sermon. And then I remember he walked over to the stage and he goes, and I don't lift no man up, but if a man has a good sermon, it's a good message. It was in the spirit. And he goes, some people said, preach a good healing message. I just did. <laughs> and I was like, I hope people really understood that. I wonder if they figured it out. That brother just gave a message on healing without ever preaching a healing verse. Because if you truly walk in the love of God, you'll walk in divine health. You'll, you'll, you will walk in divine health. See, the love of the world, the, the love that the world talks about is not the love of God. Okay? Because the love of God doesn't endorse sin failure weakness excuses or anything love of god does not endorse any of that the love of god loves you enough to correct instruct elevate you the love of god won't leave you in the same condition the love of god just doesn't say here let me tolerate you and leave you as you are go ahead and keep walking around in a miry pit that's not love i had to tell a brother the other day i said brother i said i know why you haven't talked to me lately for months, the Lord already told me, you know why? Because you don't want the truth. No, a lot of people don't really want the truth. They want what they want to hear. You, you get what I'm saying? But, but see, I learned this. The people that love you will tell you the truth about yourself. The people that just validate your humanism, they're not really your friends. Be careful. They are well-meaning. Does that make sense? They're well-meaning. Because they don't want to offend you. They don't want to hurt your feelings. But they don't love you enough to help you so that even if you, even if you don't like them, they, they, they're, they're willing to put that on the line to help you so that you'll grow, so that you can be liberated and set free, right, from your diabolical, you understand, from your vicious cycle of life, right? And, and I said, that's why you don't talk, because you, I tell you the truth. Now, here's what you got to realize. And I, and I shared this with a brother. You may not like everybody's tone. You know what I mean? Look, man, I, I got a pastor. And I'll tell you this. The tone that that man has spoken in my life is not always monotone and perfect. And, you know, and, and if you're not spiritual, you go, oh, that brother's being out and your pride wells up and your hurt feelings and all this little drama comes through your flesh. 
and all you heard was the tone. It's true, a soft answer turned away wrath. But here's what you need to recognize. Not everybody is going to communicate to you on the level you want them to. And if they don't, you need to be able to to weed through what is truth, no matter what package it comes in. Amen. It, and one day it may come like very calm, but you don't know what's going on in a person's life. They're, hu they're human in a sense. So don't expect them to just always. And so all those people you see on TV that are preaching, they're like, hi, hello. Yes, praise the Lord. Wonderful. Isn't, then they go home and they'd be like slapping their wives and stuff. You hear about it later on because they had a public pr presentation. Remember, your, your public life, I mean, uh, you know, should be reflected by your, your, you know, spiritual life. I like this. John Wooden. John Wooden. How many know who John Wooden is? John Wooden is the greatest coach of all time. Businesses use him. John Wooden was a Christian man. Coach the, he's the greatest coach. John Wooden said, be more concerned with your character than your reputation. Be more concerned. For your reputation is just what you think others think of you. But your character is who you are, friend. Remember that. Who cares about your little reputation? My reputation might be. You better be concerned about what God thinks. I'll tell you, and the guy that mentored me, he's, he's a judge in a four-point something at Hastings. And he told me, uh, if, if you have been right with God, you're not afraid of what man thinks about you. Amen. You're not afraid of what man, that brother was, that brother this, that brother went to prison, that brother was divorced, that brother was a drug addict, that brother, let me walk you over to the mirror. <laughs> Amen. You got enough business in your own life rather than be looking at people's little faults. Amen. Now that don't mean we can't generalize the world, right? But you shouldn't be like really looking at other people's faults, so to speak, because everybody in this room got a fault. Amen. That take out. That's it, brother. Take out that old. Take out that plank out of your own eye, and then you'll what? That's right. See, he got that. The plank is in your eye. The speck. If you study that real quick, I remember that the revelation, the speck is in the other person's eye. That's why you always got to let Jesus deconstruct the ugliness in you first. Then you'll be able to see clearly, right? Now that doesn't, you know, like I said, let's, so let's get where we got to go. Amen. It's been good anyway. Don't you agree? Uh, and I wrote notes down because like the other day I did something on Facebook and I, but I, I just spoke by heart, you know, but there's so much that comes. Like Brother Mark said, a point here, a point there. So many points, right? So uh, Hebrews uh, 5, thank you. We trust the Holy Ghost now. Who in the day, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that's able to save him from death, and he was heard that he reverenced, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called to God high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we got many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing your dull of hearing. Now, let me just add this here. He says, I can't even speak upon certain things because of what? Because why? Be huh? They're not ready for it. Why aren't they ready? Because they're dull. Now, what this means is this is that you and I directly reflect or uh, help the process of what God speaks to us. Listen, that's so important. Amen. It's so very important, especially when we come to church. That's why when we come to church, we don't want to come just, oh, church. We have to come expecting and we have to come whoever's in this pulpit as seeing them as though God is speaking through them himself. That's what, that's what the apostle Paul said in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, he said that when you receive the word of God, you didn't receive it as the word of man, but as it is the word of God, right? God ain't going to come down and give you a personal conversation, but he's going to, he'll give you revelation out of his word through human lips. Amen. People go, well, man, read the Bible. 
Yes, man wrote the Bible. But God breathed and illuminated him and elevated him. It's like this. Let me just tell you this. You know, some of these great people that they, they think they're great, like uh, the psychologist. I forget his name. Uh, what's that one famous guy with, with Pablo's dog? Huh? With Pablo's dog. Huh? Yeah. What's his name again? All those guys. I studied psychology in college. I had to take it. And all these. Huh? Yeah. 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 But later on down the year. Anyway, some of them would use cocaine. No, serious. Do your research. I, they do. Co they did cocaine and other things to elevate their thinking. They said, you know, they're, they're psychologists go in. If you take psychology in college, you'll see that they, they went in there. And so they're, <laughs> Where do you think the stream of thoughts was coming from when somebody's on cocaine? <laughs> so, I mean, all a lot of information that are, are you get in college came from a man. Nobody ever questioned that. Where'd that brother get those? Or Mozart or some of these people. No one ever questioned. So why would you question, you know, that the Bible was written by man? See how the devil tries to seep in and distort things? Of course it was written by man. Jesus was a man, wasn't he? He was the God man. The, the, the logos came into this earth. And then he released the rhema. Amen? So it says right here, now he says, of whom we have many things to say, for when the time is you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is what? Unskillful, right? He's unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's obeyed. But strong meat, strong meat belongs to those who by reason uh, have uh, their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let's go on to maturity, perfection. Not laying again the foundation uh, of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Uh, or of the doctrine of baptisms and of the what? Talk to me. The what? Laying on of hands. Hebrews 6. Uh, laying on of hands. Resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. Now, I, I'm hoping I can get to these notes this morning because... Uh, but here's what I want to want to tell you about. We're, we're going to talk about exercising spiritual becoming conscious and being able to exercise. So you're able to discern what is good and what is evil. Now, when we use good and evil, let's move away from, you know, that's evil over there. Look at that brother or look at that sister. You need to understand that the evil has a lot, so many Christians, and because they're uneducated, they think evil is like, yeah, that was an evil act. So they see evil as every action. Do you understand? But evil is a spiritual force, right? Evil comes outside of the realm of God. It comes from the dark realm. Yes, that's where evil is derived from. Okay, and um. So you and I, though, and a lot of people don't even know what evil is. Here's what they think evil is. Let's get rid of all the stuff. And I don't want to hammer it because I think you guys know evil. OK, drug addictions, all the stuff you see that is kind of gross in the world. Right. Prostitution, homosexuality, all these things people call evils. OK, <laughs> but let's get beyond the manifestations of evil. Because some of the most heinous things that are evil is a heart. An evil heart of unbelief. There's lots of Christians and lots of people in the world don't even have a clue of what these things are talking about here. And that's why he says, for instance, here, if you look right now, he says they're unskillful. What does that mean? They're, they're, they're not a journeyman, like in the trades, whether you're a plumber, an electrician, carpenter. You start out as an apprentice, right? 
and then you become a journeyman after a number of years of training and understanding and growth. And so what he says is, but, but they're unskillful in the word of righteousness, righteousness, and they're still underdeveloped. Now, um, what we see going on today, like in America, I want you to see in Hebrews 6 here. See, there's all these things like, do you know faith towards God is elementary? It's kindergarten. Faith towards God. Look what it says. First principles of the oracles of God. This is offensive to many people because it's like what Brother Mark said. You know, the, one of my CDs in the back that no one ever buys is Faith School 101. Because you know why? Everyone thinks they're a giant in faith in America. Everyone thinks they're a giant. You can't find anybody that would say, Lord, help my faith or help my unbelief. Everyone thinks they're a giant of faith. I'll go to a mega church. I'll go to this. And that doesn't mean that you have faith that's developed. Your faith only develops by your decision to create, cultivate your faith. Do you understand? Faith is like any other part. It's like a muscle. You choose to lift weights. You're going to develop that muscle. You have to develop that spiritual aspect of your life called the faith life. And, and church is a part of it. Do you know that? It's not the whole thing, though. You are not going to develop the kind of faith that God wants you to live in just coming to church a couple times a week. It's going to have to play out more in your personal life. Okay? And then it's going to have to... There, there's many aspects to it. It all starts with the heart. And when Jesus came on the scene, he recognized that. That's why he said... I don't want lip service. I want a heart-to-heart -heart interaction. I don't want you just to, you know, uh, 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 go through the motions, but I want you to be engaged with the motions you're going through. Amen. I don't just, I just don't want affirmation from the mouth. I want that heart involved. Amen. Now, when the heart and the mouth come together, there's a supernatural release of the things of God into our lives. But the key is, is to stay on that. How many of you know? It's to continue to consecrate. And the, the problem is many times people get in, but then they don't know how to stay steady on something. Do you know that? They don't, they, they don't know how to hold fast. It's a, human, uh, it's a human flaw. You might get a victory, but then you let up on the battle. How many of you know? You get a little breakthrough, and the next thing you know, you just kind of like, man, I've been believing God for that resource or that healing. And then all of a sudden, you just kick back, and you stop doing what you did to get yourself, you know, some of those benefits of, of uh, uh, receiving from the Father, right? And you kind of just put the brakes on slowly, and that's what the enemy does. He just gets you to disengage instead of you going, whoo, I got this blessing now. Let me uh, throw that 18-wheeler into overdrive and go to the next level going way beyond but the human nature is to just kind of just take care of itself life and when jesus came and entered in your life he wants to break you out of you right that's like why i like what brother mark says, says you're such a new creation in christ you have to let god introduce you to the real you see the real you when you look in the mirror ain't you know, you got this color hair and these eyes and this facial skin and this color and, and, and my background's from this. and my That ain't the real you, friend. Look, and that's why you got so many challenges all through the country right now. They have politics, Democrats, race, uh, all this economic standings, you know, educational places. You know, I got five degrees. You only got one. Bunch of trash. Lots of Christians are they're seeped into that when Paul simply came and said, Paul said, he said, you say you're of Apollos, you say you're of Peter. They fell into that in the old days too. How many of you know that? They say, they say they're, can someone grab that door for that young lady? Yeah. Come on, fellas. <laughs> so what I'm saying, he said, you say you're of this, you say you're of that. And actually Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, he said, I don't even know any man anymore after the flesh. Do you know that? Serious, are you hearing me? And I'm kind of like, when I look at a lot of American Christians, I'm thinking, man, boy, y'all need to go to, you need an upgrade, man, because it's a disgrace. They can't get, Jesus does not 
look at anything but the reality of being a new creation in Christ. Don't care what color you are. Don't care what church you go to, what denomination you're from. You either got faith and have a revelation of who you are in Christ. That's what Galatians says. He who walks in the reality of a new creation, the God of peace be on him. You ain't walking in that truth, then there ain't no peace. You just like play acting out in the world. Like you're just, I'll go to church. What church you go to? You identify with some big church. See, if you live in the Midwest, you go, oh, I go to that church. And you feel all proud. And you're like, yeah, I go to that church. You know, my church, my pastors, what's his name? You know, Joel Osteen or, or T.D. Jakes or, you know, I go to that church. Okay, you're going to tell that to Jesus when you stand before him? You know, Jesus, I went to Joel Steen's church, Jesus. You know, T.D. Jakes was my pastor. I saw him drive by my house one time. You know, he drove by and I waved to him. And he waved back. Or, or uh, you know, whatever else. Joyce Meyer or, or whoever you like. None of that will float with Jesus. None of it. People don't realize that that ain't going to work with Jesus. So here you go. He says, right here so it's discernment exercise and paul said I want, i'm gonna take i'm just gonna float over there real quick you can go to galatians if you want i'm gonna float over there just to show you because i quote a lot of scriptures and if, if america is gonna see a shift it's gonna be from the church friend and the church is made up of many different many different backgrounds but that's what's so lovely at the cross. Your backgrounds and everything just dies right there. That's why, you know, we don't put certain things on the front of the building. Amen. We don't identify. And I know a lot of pastors, you know what I mean, that are from different ethnicities. And it's like, you know, a pastor should believe for a congregation full of every ethnicity. Do you know that? It shouldn't be like the first white congregation of the Presbyterians or the first Asian or the first black or the first Filipino. I go all through the world, the first Brazilian church. <laughs> There's so, and I'm just thinking, what is these people need to get in the word, man. I mean, even Jesus, you know, most people don't even know Abraham wasn't even a Jew. He was a Syrian. God created all man, but he ain't looking at the inward. Amen. So I'm not hammering on that, but that's, that's just one aspect that shows you that people don't understand the difference. They're not in revelation. They're not really walking in the reality. In Galatians, let me go over there to Galatians real quick. There you go. Great. Galatians chapter six. I'm going to show you this. Galatians six and ver verse 15. For there is neither circumcision, that was the Jew, for neither is circumcision now of any importance, nor uncircumcision. Isn't this amazing? This is revelation, man. This takes you to the next level, really. Watch, I'll show you. Oh, man. It's of any importance, but only a new creation. The result of a new birth and new nature in Christ. Peace and mercy are upon all them who walk according to this law, who discipline themselves and regulate their lives by this principle, even upon the true Israel of God. Woo! There you go. Go to Ephesians real quick. How many of you want the word this morning? A lot of people go, I know all that. It's not what you know. It's what you live. It's what's applied. It's, it's what fruit is produced out of that revelation in your life. It's not what you and I can just regurgitate mentally uh, and, and, and out of our intellect. It is a truth that is lived out in our lives. Amen? It's a truth that's lived out. So here you go. Look at Ephesians 2. Then we got to get back to where I was going. Ephesians 2. This is one of my... Favorite verses. Hold on. Go over here. Uh, ready? Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you are sometimes a far away. So far away. 
in and through the blood of Christ have been brought near. That's Ephesians 2.13. For he himself is your what? Peace. Ephesians 2, verse 14 now. He is your peace, unity, harmony. He made, come on now. He made what? Both one. Right? So you got all these problems going on in the world. And the Christians can't live this truth. A lot of them don't live it. A lot of them. It says, made, made both one. And he broke down the middle wall partition uh, between them. And abolished the, the hostile dividing wall. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in order, making himself of one new man. So making peace. You better get in the word and know Jesus if you even plan on operating in any harmony. Come on now. And if Jesus broke the wall between Jew and Gentile, listen, friend, and you don't get that revelation, because at that time they were God's chosen people. They were God's chosen. Chosen because of their skin color. They were chosen because of an Abraham. It's the only reason. He had faith. Abraham believed God. God said, okay, I select you then. I know you believe, and I know that you have a, a heart that's going to, uh, uh, you know, you're going to lead your children. You're going to teach your children by methods. You're going to download that to your next generation if you'll believe me, and you'll be obedient. And out of that came a race. That's simple. One man. One man. But what happens is because man doesn't discern, as was said here, they're carnal. They start looking at, we're the chosen race. You clown, you're a chosen race because you're supposed to be a light. You're supposed to be escorting others in. But instead, you're stuck on yourself and on your blessing. You're stuck on your culture. separate yourself he said separate yourself so that you don't contaminate yourself not because you're better than because i need you to stay holy so i can influence that generation the reality is is they can't discern just like today a lot of people so let's go back now and i want to read you this from brother mark's book because I, I i i just meditate on this and i actually heard him say it the other day and i love this Quoting James Stalker, he says, the nature of man, according to Paul, normally consists in three sections, body, soul, and spirit. To emphasize proper order, I refer to it as spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. Most people go, oh, yeah, my body, my spirit. Uh-uh, you better have, see, that shows you their minds aren't renewed. The most significant part of your existence is your spirit. That's why you should say, like uh, one brother said, I am a spirit. I have a soul and I live in a body. Because if you don't discern who you really are, see, when your feelings get hurt, it's not your spirit. It's your emotions. It's your pride. It, it's a part of your, your, your outward uh, soul, your suki. So if you can't discern, no, 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 no. I got to put the love of God on that feeling right now, devil. I got to quarantine that, that, that offense. I've got to, I got to stifle out that insecurity. I've got to uh, move away from that self-pity. Let me quarantine that with the agape. See, if you don't know the difference, then you'll just be immersed in your feelings, you know, like, and your emotions, and they'll deceive you. That's what he says right here. They don't know the difference. He says, in its original constitution, I love, I love this. These occupied a definite relationships of superiority and subordination to one another. People don't even like that word today. Subordination to one another. The spirit being supreme. The body, the least important. The body is the least important. But see, when you're body-minded and body-ruled, what that means is the body just has all its expressions. It just, you know, has all its thoughts, its opinions, its, its wants, its desires, its needs. And how many of you understand what I mean? 
And then eventually it crashes. It's just body ruled, ruled by the body. Lots of Christians are born again. They're regenerated and they think, well, I'm a Christian. So that, that's like the end of their journey. It's just the beginning. It's the beginning of your journey. God wants you to be transformed. Now, here he goes. He says, I, I got to get to the meat of this message. The soul occupies the middle position. But in the fall, uh, they were disarranged. When Adam fell, they, the order was disarranged. And all sin consists in the usurpation of the body by the soul in place of the spirit ruling. See, in the fall of these two, uh, uh, these two inferior sections of the human nature, which Paul called the flesh. So when you think of the flesh, think of the soul and the body. And that's why Wigglesworth said our only safeguard from dropping back into my natural mind. See, my natural mind says, there ain't no hell. What loving God would ever send people to hell? What loving God? God never sends people to hell. They send themselves. Why would you reject God's love? Well, you know, I knew these, and matter of fact, one person on that thread said, I can't imagine being in, being in somewhere surrounded by all these Christians. Then someone else chimed back and said, why are you on a Christian page if you have such hatred for Christians? <laughs> Has nothing to do with what God wants. Matter of fact, here's a good example. Receive it. Healing is not a, 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 a it's not whether you, God wants you healed or not. You know, he came to the pool of Bethesda, Jesus. And you know what, what did Jesus say? Someone tell me what the scripture says. What did Jesus say? Jesus didn't heal him. What did Jesus ask the man at the pool of Bethesda? He wished to be well. He wanted to be healed. Say it again. He wished to be well. He wanted did, to be healed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, why didn't Jesus just heal him? Huh? It's, it wasn't God's choice. Whose decision was it? He provides the means of healing, but it's your job to access it, receive it. I heard a lady in Palm Springs one time. This guy I used to watch him. He used to preach. And this lady had been pursuing healing for like 15 years. And I, I thought, that's an interesting statement. She came that night and got healed. And he said, see, she's been pursuing healing 15 years, but tonight she just received it. I thought, well, what about all those 15 years? Wasn't she receiving then? Not really. She was pressing towards the place where her faith finally was able to grab it. How many of you have had that experience in different areas of life? You're trusting, you're kind of praying, and then all of a sudden one day just in prayer, you're like, Thank you, Father. You move into that place of faith. So he says right here, let me hear it. He says right here, he says, Paul calls it the flesh. It's a side of, oh, this, is, this is revelation, man. Feed on this. This is the side of human nature that looks to the world and time. The world and time, you know what I mean? Uh, and have taken possession of the throne and completely rule the life while the spirit of man, the, the side of man that looks to eternity has been dethroned and reduced to a condition of inefficiency. See, Christ restores the lost predominance of the spirit of man by taking possession with the Holy Spirit. So I would ask you today, even though I've read this, in this church, lots of times, it still excites me. I read it on my own. I shared it three times this week with three different people. Because it is a revelation. See, it's not just up here. It's in the heart. And I've got to recognize who I am as a believer. See, if, I, if I'm just kind of toying around with that, and I'm not really conditioned, just like I told Trent Caleb. See, if you want to hang with the little boys and you don't want to become a great athlete, then you just do what everybody else does. You have fun. You have fun. And having fun, there's always a price. 
Remember this. A man sows whatever he, a man reaps whatever he sows. He that sows to the natural will of the natural receive of the natural, the flesh. He that invests in the spirit will of the spirit. See, the harvest you and I receive will be determined not by God, but rather by us. I'm not talking about harvest of money. I'm talking about harvest of revelation, harvest of intimacy with God. God loves everybody the same in here. Do you know that? God loves everybody the same in here. There's no difference for the love of God for me or you or anybody else. He loves everybody equally the same in here. But how many people will really go to him and, and say, man, I'm going to relish in that love, Lord. You have different, different places that people go to. Some people go, I want all your love, God, but then I still want my life in the world. Well, I want all your love, but I want to still have the world's way. And God allows that. But it costs them. Because they're not, how many of you know, they're not ready to get rid of all their, their garments. And that takes time, doesn't it? Get rid of those garments of attachments of this world. So he says, he says, Christ restores the lost predominance when his spirit comes in the human spirit, vivifying and sustaining it in such a growing strength that it becomes more and more part of man's constitution. That's called conditioning, isn't it? Over a process of time, you become more and more in harmony. You begin to exercise. You're trained. Come on, shoot over to 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 10. 1 Corinthians 10. You become more on the, the level of the, of, of the constitution of man. Man ceases to be carnal and becomes spiritual. How can we say you're spiritual? People, this is funny in, in America. They go, those brothers were working miracles. People were getting healed. They think that's spiritual. I'll tell you what spiritual is. Spiritual is the practice of consecration. Spiritual is the practice of prayer. Spiritual is the practice of forgiveness when you don't feel like it. It's the practice of love when someone don't deserve it. It's the practice of being kind when they treat you like garbage. Right? These are, these are truths. Spiritual doesn't have a lot to do with what goes on in, in you know, miracles and signs and wonders. Because if you look at the church of 1 Corinth, they were the most carnalist church in the whole Bible. And yet they had more miracles than any other church. Do you know that? They were the most carnal church they had a lot of strife they had a lot of fornication they had a lot of lust they had a lot of incest with relatives and parents they had uh, uh they had a lot of uh uh you know uh, uh, uh homosexuality they did read it they had a lot of this stuff going on in the church of corinth but guess what they had a lot of miracles look at the gifts of the spirit they're in the bible and it's the place where God, where Paul addressed the love of God. They had a lot of these things going on, just like San Francisco. A lot of miracles. They had the nine gifts of the Spirit. You find that in 1 Corinthians, what? 12. 1 Corinthians 13 is love. 1 Corinthians 14 breaks down prophecy, tongues, interpretation. They had a lot of gifts. A lot of that stuff. But you've seen all the other things of the flesh and, and the 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 identification with humanism in there and all the sinfulness. You see it, but they had all the gifts. So Paul told them it's not all the gifts and everything that make, make you mature and spiritual, is it? Mm -mm. It's the reality of walking in God. And he even told them, you are yet babes, and I can't even speak unto you as me, because you're acting like what? Who knows what he said? You're acting like what? Mere men. What's a mere man? What's a mere man? A man outside of Christ is just, right? Natural, just governed by the flesh. Does what it wants. Acts the way it wants. So that's what he said to them. Now, I'm going to read a couple things. Look at 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 10. we got a little time left. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 10. Is anybody getting anything or are you, you're kind of going home? You're challenged. <laughs> first corinthians 10 this is where we got to live and here's the, why america look we're still not going to see revival there's so many people someone told me the other day we're going to see revival when you got all these people they're still waiting for trump 
They're waiting for Biden. Biden signed this and Trump's this, this. Do you think? Good. I mean, you know, however it works. But I'm a person of the word and of Jesus. You never have revival or awakening without repentance. I don't care if this prophet such and such said, prophet such and such said, I don't care. He is not a prophet. You cannot prophesy beyond the word. And there's no place in scripture you ever see a move of God without the people or the body of believers bringing repentance first, meaning turning away, laying aside worldly endeavors, worldly artifacts. You never see an outpouring of God, even on the day of Pentecost. They already had yielded to Jesus's lordship. Then God poured out. He only pours out in the proximity of faith. He's not going to pour out on this guy walking down the street who's an unbeliever. He's not a target. God targets faith. The only reason God had even, uh, the only reason God would ever move in that person's life is because he had a relative that prayed. And then that relative that prayed to God, God would say, hey, uh, hey brother, go over and speak to that guy. You don't believe that? Then go read Acts 10, Cornelius. Go with the Bible, man. So many people, they're in such error. It's, it's silly. They don't know God and they don't know the word. Amen. There, God has a God has a precedent. Repentance, meaning not you know, forgive me for being so horrible. I'm not talking about that stupid religious repentance garbage. I'm talking about what it says right here. You have need that one teaches the first principles of oracles of God. What did he say? Let's go on from the doctrine, not laying again the foundation. See that. Repentance is a foundational truth for every Christian. It's what the Bible said. If you like the Bible, you agree with the Bible. If you, if you want to do like that lady on Charisma Magazine and go, that's a bunch of nonsense. And So you're usurping your intellect, your thought life above Scripture now. Okay. See if that works. Repentance is a lifestyle. But let me just add this because my message ain't on repentance. Do you know why you repent? You turn away from your mentality, from your way, because you've seen that your way doesn't produce. So then you go, gosh, my way isn't working. The goodness of God turns you to him and leads you to a place of transformation where you go I can remember like five years ago I have I got the same mindset but five years ago I had that same condition and I failed why am I going to repeat the same system why not learn grow and move forward huh and and then live in a place of dominion Dominion instead of doing the roller coaster ride. And, and I asked the, the Lord, I said, why did the children of Israel get free? Read the book of Judges. God brought them judges. They got delivered. Then they fell back into ungodliness. They got delivered. They fell back. Why? What, what is it about the human condition that it's? Why can't it just be like, oh, why can't it? The body. Lack of renewing your mind. Being so connected with your earthly, earthly identification that you just quit pursuing the things of God. You, you get satisfied with, with just what you get in life. Most people today, they're just, they're, they're just, you hear people, I just wanted to go back to normal. You know what they mean by normal, friend? I want to go back to just doing my life. I want to eat. I want to go out, watch movies, see sports. I want to do what I want, hit the bar, have fun, dance, go on vacation. This is what they mean. I want to go have a fun life, entertainment. That's, I want to go back to normal. Because here's the truth. Just like the children of Israel were in the wilderness, 
And they had enough food to be sustained, didn't they? Did they? Most people today have enough food and water to be sustained. But the flesh says, meat, meat, meat. I want my meat back. <laughs> Come on. You did, when they were in the wilderness, they wanted meat back. They weren't happy with what they got. God said, here, just have this, have this angel food right now. You know, you just, just eat this manna for a little while. I'm going to bring you to the land of milk and honey. Just, just live off your faith. Eat this little manna right now, and, and we'll get you there, and it'll be milk and honey. But along the way, they were like, meat, meat, meat. I want my life back now. We should have we never left Egypt. See how they started going against God? Evil, evil, evil. Bunch of evil hearts of unbelief. Doubters and fearful, a lack of trust and lack of faith. And they said, you know, you brought us out here. And then they start getting twisted in their mind. They get distorted and perverse. And they started going, Moses, Moses, you brought us out here to kill us. And you guys can't see that. You can't see it. You need to go home and meditate. You can't see it. But that's how distorted some Christians get. Their mind gets warped that bad, they start accusing. Of course, they're not going to accuse God because nobody in their right mind is going to stand up. They don't, have, they don't have the guts. You'd be better off standing up before God and blaming him in his face than accusing one of God's leaders. There's only one man that accused God to his face, and God had respect to him. Do you know who that was? Job. The rest of them all go through the, the bunk channel. Fear, they're governed. You know, Moses, you did this to me. Mo Moses is like, what did I do? I just obeyed God. I didn't tell you to come. You followed. Job's the only one that got up in the face of God and said, hey, man, what you doing here? A lot of people like that. So they went out and they evil, man. Blaming God. Blaming Moses. Blaming God. I mean, Horrible. When God's leading them, because why? They didn't control themselves. They were governed by their emotions, their appetite. The devil inspired them. They listened to the voice of the enemy more. As soon as Moses went away with God to get some more to help the, help the people, you know what happened? They said, Man, where'd Moses go? You know, we're all out here by ourselves. And, and, and throw your jewelry in and Aaron and make a golden calf. And everybody get naked and start drinking and having sex and fornicating and having fun. Fun, fun, fun. Read the Bible. It's what, let me just add this. In a time of when the pressure's on, when pressure comes on, do you know what people do? They do the craziest stuff. They, people, because control is such an issue for, for humanity. People, when they feel like they're losing control, they break out. How many of you know that? They break out with many ways. They got to drink hard, like alcoholism is a drug addiction. They, they've got to you know, rage, kill, fight. They, there has to be a release of, of the flesh in some way. And guess who orchestrates all that? The devil. And, and some Christians yield to that because they're not mature. They, they still need milk. But you can't give them milk. They're like, nah. Give me a piece of meat, but they're really an infant, right? They're really an infant, but they want a steak, <laughs> you know? So look, let me, let me, let me read you this in 1 Corinthians. Now, I, I'm not, I didn't make this message for you, it's for us, because I don't want to be part of that. I, I don't. I want to do like God said, come out from among them. Come out from that system. Now, everything we're talking about, if you're sitting here today, and you're hearing it as like duty oriented. You know what I mean? Okay. If you're telling yourself right now, I'm going to stop sinning. I'm going to stop doing this. And I'm going to stop doing this. Then you miss the whole boat. Because everything I'm talking about is a mentality. A, a mindset. See, a lot of people understand love. It's the most simple aspect. But love can't really work right without these other aspects. Now, I got, I got to read you this just to show you. First Corinthians 10, and I'll quote a couple things and we'll close. It's already 12 o'clock. I didn't even get to these notes. That's all right. We did what we had to do. We have to condition ourselves. But we, let me say that better. We have to cooperate 
with the Holy Spirit so we condition ourselves. I can't condition myself outside of the, the move of God. What I can do is by faith, feed on the word, yield to the Holy Ghost, right? Like last night, just simple things. Like I had my contacts on. I was going to lay down. He's like, take your contacts out. I'm like, uh, and I'm already walking out the bathroom. He's like, take your contacts out. Because, you, you know, it's not good to sleep with your contacts. Just take them. And, and, and then the Lord just prompts me. He's like, see, it's small things like that that condition you. And if you can't listen to small things that the Lord's trying to do to help you, then how can you listen for bigger things? Simple things. And I stopped and I went, yep, gosh, what is it about my flesh that I just want to lay down? I just want to lay down with my contacts in my eyes. It seems insane, doesn't it? But you know why? Because I've laid down with my contacts in my eyes and it didn't mess my eyes up. So I got away with it. But there's times I lay down and I slept too long with my contacts and it messed my eyes up. So I was taxed. I received a just recompense for my behavior. God didn't do it. He tried to set me free, but I didn't want to listen. See, it's not about right or wrong. It's about your obedience to his leadership, to his leading. And when you get that, you get that nice beamer. <laughs> you get that one with no chafe in the back. <laughs> You get that one that's dent free. <laughs> that one that has a good seal on the roof so the rain doesn't leak in there. You don't mind me using that now. <laughs> All right, but here you go. First Corinthians, then a couple more, we'll close. Here it is, here it is. Here's the part I want you to see in First Corinthians, though. You all know this stuff, but I I'll tell you, it's not what I know. It's, it's what I'm, I, I, I want to learn to practice on a regular basis. First Corinthians 10, do, 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 hold on a second, hold on, I missed my place up, oh, my, I gave you the wrong direction, I should have looked at my note, For, see, assumption will get you, First Corinthians 9, verse 24, do you not all know that all run in a race, all the runners compete, uh, but only one receives a prize? So run your race that you may lay hold, right? You're running with a vision and make it yours. Now, every athlete that goes into training conducts himself temporarily and restricts himself in all things. They do it to get a, a natural wreath, but you do it to receive an eternal blessedness. Don't run without uncertain, don't run as uncertain and without definite aim. And then he goes on and tells you, my whole point right there is he's talking about training. See, training. No athlete, just Tom Brady. Come on now. Uh, Tom Brady is going to play in the Super Bowl next week. So Tom Brady, look it. See, the person that's trained, the person that's conditioned themselves, and this is what we know. We know it to be true. But all the haters come out. They're like, People hate. They go, I don't want to see Brady in another Super Bowl. Is it Brady's fault that he trained and conditioned himself? And, and he, he, But because, see, he won with the Patriots, and they say, oh, yeah, now. Then he goes to a losing team. And he's inserted into a losing team system, but now they're in the Super Bowl. So what do you and I want to humble ourselves and learn from this? And that's this, that certain people condition Certain people train, and, and, and no matter where you put them, in, in a corner of East Africa or, or in a corner of Tibet or, or in the United States, they, they are going to grow and thrive and flourish. They have conditioned themselves spiritually. Now, Brady did it physically. And you can hate and downplay them and talk bad about them all you want. But that person will continue to thrive and that person will continue to go forward because they knew this principle. Now, here you go. I, 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 gotta, I wanna read, oh man. Go to Ephesians 5. I'm gonna give you, hmm, 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 hmm. We're not getting here. I'm just gonna rest and I'll share. 
Let's see. I'll choose one of these and we'll we'll close it. I think I want to I want to look at I want to look at Ephesians five and maybe some of you want to take a picture of these notes. You can, but Ephesians five, and then I'm going to quote First Samuel five because it came to my spirit this morning, my heart. What we're saying is, let's not be like everybody else. Now we have to define that, don't we? Which I'm not doing today. I'm just laying a foundation. We got to define how are we going to not be like the rest of the world, besides not sinning. <laughs> how really? I mean, you know, your life should not be a concentration of I'm not going to sin. I mean, I remember when I first became a Christian, it was like that's why I thought. I thought like I got to be good. I got to be good. So I really strove, but I always failed. I was like in, in the book of Mark, you know, where it says the seed went in and for a, a period of time, he received it with joy. But then after a while, persecution, affliction, and trials came. I, and I saw that in myself. I was like, man, how do I become like the soil that receives God, is happy about it when I get it? But that is, and you know what it got down to? Being watchful. Watchful and sober. And, and I kept doing the same things, but I had to be consistent. And one day I said, well, I, I, I'm joyful and, I, and, I, and it hadn't been stolen. You know what I mean by stolen? Like you're doing good for a period of time and then you go, you sin or you open your mouth or you rage out or you flesh out, you, right? Somehow you collapse. But you didn't do it. You made it through. Because you yield it to him. To that, and that works in healing and finances, whatever area. So here you go. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 tells you in verse 8, For you were once darkness. Now you are light in the Lord. Walk and lead a life as those native to the light. Look, if you're leading a life native to the light, you're not going to have a desire to work evil or darkness in the earth, are you? So all the people you see in the earth today, if they're living contrary to light, be aware. Be aware. Be cautious. That doesn't mean people don't fail. You get my point? You know what I mean? You and I will probably fail at some point in little errors, but don't stay in failure, man. Don't stay in a failed attitude. Don't stay in a failed lifestyle. Don't stay there basking in the weakness of the flesh. Amen. Allow the light of the glory of God to help you to rise up. You know how you rise up? Run to your father, man. Run to the father daily. Look, I may not be sinning, but I'll tell you this, that's not the end of my Christian walk. It's just to not sin. There's so much more. And actually, I find out that when I go beyond, man, I start enjoying my Christianity. I wouldn't want to be at any other place in this world today. And I'm not trying not to sin. Like this morning, I didn't wake up and think, I'm not going to sin today. I just woke up praising God, seeking God, and actually saying, Lord, what can I give the people? Forget what I want to preach. What do you want me to give the people? And I gave you guys the same thing I gave my son yesterday about us training ourselves, letting the Holy Ghost help so we can discern what is good and evil. And the first place it has to start with is in your own heart. Discern that. Recognize what is beneficial to you is that bringing you closer to God or is it really stripping you? Is the devil robbing you with your own permission? Is he stealing you with the TV, the Facebook, the whatever kind of, you know, strife that you find? Be careful. Is he stripping you with politics, racial things, economic things right now? Is he, is he stripping and stealing from you because you're, you're more influenced by this between your ears than you are right here? And the only way this could be synchronized with God is through his word. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's leave the Saul mentality. You remember Saul? Saul's like, Saul and the children of Israel are like, we want to be like what? 
Remember, they wanted a king. And they said, we want to be like others. We want to be like them. I want to ask you today, who do you want to be like? And you better know who you want to be like. If you're like, like if you ask a lot of young people, they're going to say, I want to be like, you know, some famous person. When I was a child, when I, when I was a child, I talked like a child. Who do you want to be like? Not like they said, we want to be like the other nations. Man, I want to be like Jesus. Amen. My God, when I think of Jesus, I think, how can a man ever be like Jesus, though? Serious. How can a man be like Jesus or a woman? I mean, dude, that's, that's, that's some true confidence. That's some wisdom. That's somebody who's disciplined that goes, when, when someone else is bloviating their garbage and their filth, Jesus is like, that's somebody that's, established with his intimacy with God that he goes, Brother Kim, there's the door if you like. How about you, Peter? <laughs> you want to follow that? Not, he didn't do it out of hatred, didn't do it out of meanness, just Jesus was this person that had such this deep, intimate relationship with God that was able to spit wisdom. He was able to implement it. He was able, uh, you know, at the right time to deal with the different issues complex issues of race of tension come on now if you can't see that in the word then you really you need your eyes open but jesus never compromised i always do what the father did all right let's stand up praise the lord this message was brought to you by living water fellowship san francisco you can connect with us on facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com